From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Good Sunday afternoon. Welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Kate Walsh. Puerto Rico is in the midst of a severe economic crisis with more than $70 billion of debt. And on May 2nd, their government failed to pay a $399 million debt payment. As a result, Puerto Rico may have to slash funding for education, hospitals, even Zika virus prevention programs. And it has a major impact on the continental United States, especially here in western Massachusetts and the greater Springfield and Holyoke area. So today on 22 News in Focus, we'll look at the causes behind this crisis and what's being done locally to provide support to families looking to relocate here. So we have a panel of guests today. They include David Silva, Executive Director of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, Jose Ribeiro, Director of the Massachusetts Latino Chamber of Commerce, Adam Gomez, Ward 1 Springfield City Councilor, and Nelson Roman, Ward 2 Holyoke City Councilor. So before we get into all the specifics, let's give people at home a little bit of background on how you guys may be impacted by this crisis or your background as people here that are experts, so to speak, on uh, Puerto Rico. So we'll start with you. Yes, so uh, thank you so much for letting us be here and address the crisis in Puerto Rico. So uh, for me specifically, I speak to the diaspora uh, throughout all Western Mass, and I think that's why I'm very honored to be here with these esteemed gentlemen. But specifically, the city of Holyoke is severely impacted. It's the number one city in the U.S. percentage per capita of Puerto Ricans within a, a community, number one at 44.70%. So this is truly going to impact the city of Holyoke with regards to this diaspora of, of, of migrants, not immigrants, let's be clear about that, from the island of Puerto Rico are going to come here to the mainland U.S. and we've already begun to see that. I see young kids coming from Puerto Rico who are younger men and women who are in their twen 20s and teens who are coming here for jobs but their parents and families are still back in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. looking for work. So this directly impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and around the work that we do and that's why for me I feel that I'm here to speak to that and truly address the colonization and the systemic uh, racism and coloniz colonization that the U.S. has had in the island of Puerto mm -hmm. Rico so that's why I'm here today. Well, um, growing up in the north end of Springfield my whole life and being able to represent a community that's 80% uh, Latino, it's really uh, puts a, a, a way to try to figure out how, if our communities are prepared for an influx of um, people coming from the island. You know, a thousand families uh, a month are coming here, and those are the ones that can afford to leave. And um, honestly, like, uh, you know, um, our, my colleague from Holyoke, Nelson, has spoken, we, there's a lot of challenges um, ahead of us. Um, and with uh, Springfield be, being the number seven on that list of per capita Latinos, just between our two cities, it's 86,000 Puerto Ricans. We're not talking about Chicopee, Westfield, which has little diasporas within those other towns within Western Massachusetts. Oh, thank you, Katie. What, what I can tell you, uh, I don't really believe the numbers are, are going to be impacting here locally. Um, um, history has shown that the majority of people leaving Puerto Rico are going to go in the southeast, in Florida, and other parts of the country. Um, according to the, one of the reports was from 2010 to 2013, 144,000 came to the U.S. But those numbers are relative to the, ac across the whole country, and again, the majority go of them going to Florida. And even then, the low numbers coming to, um, to Western Massachusetts, we're pretty much prepared for those that are coming here. The people coming to the U.S. because of this situation are, is not like the ones in the 50s and 60s where they were, they were extremely poor. These are people that are, uh, in the majority of cases, uh, highly educated professionals. And even the ones that are not highly educated professionals, they are, uh, it's a different era. They think about starting their businesses. I mean, and, and that's what they're doing in this, in this Western Mass. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, along with our, you know, with my colleagues here, each one is addressing, you know, certain issues that are affecting folks that are coming in. Um, for the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, we have a waiting list of 30, 30 individuals that want to learn English. So um, having new migrants coming in obviously puts a drain on social service programs and programs that should be, you know, be equipped to um, welcome um, folks coming in, but also prepare them to enter their workforce. And part of that is, is the language. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from our perspective, that is a drain um, because we don't have enough capacity to meet the demand. Um, as far as the employment um, opportunities, we have, you know, uh, 
number of businesses that are coming up uh, in Springfield and Holyoke. Um, and there's, so there's a need for employment. But again, going back, um, the language is the biggest barrier. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're seeing, uh, the demand for, and obviously uh, folks need that assistance to get themselves at least going. So David, I know you're the moderator here, but regarding the, the, the 30 ones that are on a waiting list, can we specifically say that those 30 uh, individuals are on a waiting list are from the recent migration, or are there people that were already here, or? Uh, a little bit of both. Most, bit of both. most of them right now are folks that are, have been here, um, and again, they're looking for that employment opportunity. We have a, a, a for example, we have a lady that works at McDonald's, entry-level position, and um, so she's, we're, we're teaching her some of the English that is necessary for her to maintain her job. Um, at McDonald's, and uh, again, this is just an entry-level mm -hmm. position, but it's still, you know, the language still is essential for her to maintain her job. So, yeah, the, most of the 30 are folks that are already here, so as we see more and more people come in, that waiting list is going to get even longer. And if I could just yeah. interject, to me, this goes back to exactly the issues that we're talking about. I, for, for years, worked in homelessness and housing, which is a huge issue here in Western Mass. I worked for New England Farm Workers Council, and I was a homeless uh, housing coordinator. And I can tell you that the racialization of Puerto Ricans, uh, the diaspora here in the US, is an issue. And it happens here in Western Mass. So I've, I saw in my work a, a mother who had her nursing degree from the University of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. but exactly speaking to the point that Davi is saying, she could not speak any English. And because, in, 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 and it happens here, the race Socialization of Puerto Rican diaspora, she's seen as less than because she can't speak English. And to transfer that, that accessibility to resources, to just transfer her nursing license from Puerto Rico to Massachusetts, was close to $500. Mm -hmm. If she can't even work and she's struggling to survive, these are the kinds of things that we do still have to prepare for with the diaspora. There still is a deep need, and that's why for me it's advocating on a state level, national level, to provide extra resources for, for organizations like the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in Springfield, for Nueva Esperanza and Holyoke, Enlace de Familias, and let's talk about education. I can see on a day-to-day -day basis in the city of Holyoke, teens who come from the island of Puerto Rico who were AP advanced students, mm -hmm. uh, top honors, straight A's, and because of the language barrier, they're expected to take MCAS in English or be proficient in reading in English and not in their native, and not in, 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 in their language, which is Spanish. So there are some issues that we still need to address as a region and as a community, specifically here in Western Mass, that'll help us because then think about that. The dropout rates are high. Mm -hmm. Holyoke's currently in receivership, and again, I'm the chairman of the Joint Committee of the School Committee in City Council, we just got the statistics for the teaching staff of the city of Holyoke. Out of close to 500 teachers, 400 of them are white Caucasian and less than 50 are Latino Spanish. So there's a huge need and still some work that we need to do in this region because the cultural sensitivity and the racialization of mm -hmm. these communities are important. When we look at Puerto Rico though, it is a U.S. territory. Do they learn English there in school as well? Yeah, they. Um, my my cousins and family they all understand and speak english you know we still spend the american dollar in puerto rico mm -hmm. um there's a lot of american businesses um companies that move over there it's it's not like um they don't have the tools of uh of knowing what america is and how to speak the language but Primarily, Spanish is the language that they speak in Puerto right. Rico. And then even here in, um, in our communities, Spanish is still the, the, the language that's spoken at home. In the school curriculum in Puerto Rico, you're taught the very basic. Okay. Yeah. And, um, as uh, City Councilor Adam has, was talking about, there are some individuals that, that, that can you know, learn English uh, maybe more proficiently, a little bit more advanced, but um, that's not, that doesn't apply to everyone. Mm. So the majority is, as uh, City Council Adam was saying, the majority, uh, the school curriculum is Spanish based. That, mm. that, is, that is the core, so. And to just interject about the current crisis of Puerto Rico, so just to speak to Adam what David's saying, the current economic crisis was around this recession that was created from when the U.S. Congress eliminated those tax incentives in 2006. They let them sunset for companies, pharmaceutical companies, big companies, to stay in the island. Those were cut. So what is the first migration for any recession that happens in any economy? It's an education drain. Mm -hmm. So all of these educated individuals are leaving, the ones with access and money, they're leaving. So those are the first wave of individuals to leave. 
doctors, lawyers, they all come here, and what's left on the island? A smaller base of population, smaller taxes, smaller entrepreneurship levels. So those have all impacted the crisis today. And you know, if we had to give like a, a, a fire or a match starter to this current crisis, was during that 2006 time when again, current political levels, the Congress allowed those tax incentives to keep major employers in Puerto Rico to expire. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to talk about the history of, of how this all came to be and, and a little bit more about Puerto Rico and, and the Puerto Rican culture in the United States uh, when we come back from the break. But for now, you're watching 22 News in Focus. We'll be right back. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about the economic crisis in Puerto Rico that's ongoing and we have a panel of guests who are very involved with that crisis and how it affects people, especially in western Massachusetts. So right before the break we were getting into the history of the economic crisis, what may have led up to how bad it is right now. And we're going to start with you. So this is something that's not really new. Um, people have been moving from Puerto Rico to the United States and from the United States to Puerto Rico for years, right? Well, that's a, you know, on a daily basis, there's a lot of people going to Puerto Rico and a lot of people leaving Puerto Rico. I mean, as a, we all remember going to Puerto Rico as soon as the plane lands, there is a lot of uh, celebration. But this all started years ago with the Section uh, 936 that was, uh, as, as Nelson uh, mentioned, repealed in 2006, the triple tax package that gave uh, investors uh, from Puerto, that were buying bonds or getting bonds through Puerto Rico, uh, a tax break. Uh, so these tax breaks, both of these things just kind of like stopped. And in, in 2006, actually 96, um, uh, Clinton passed uh, the repeal of 936 Tax Act, which basically a lot of companies left Puerto Rico and just the pharmaceuticals remained. Uh, but I have to, you know, that's one of the reasons of uh, mismanagement of the government, uh, other issues that were happening, but I have to point out about those 144,000 that the, the New York Times reported. So that's a net number of, of people going daily and returning daily, 144,000 in four years, so it's uh, roughly 30, 35,000 per year across the whole country, most of them went to Florida. They're not all coming here, and again, it could be professionals, it could be labor, all different institutions. Now the challenges that Nelson was mentioning that we all ha have here right now, they've always existed. We're just gonna have a few more people coming in and work along with us. As far as the chamber's concerned, the people we have seen are professionals that have existing business or uh, that wanna expand it over here or, cont or, or start new ones. And even the few laymen that have, we have met that wanted to start their own business, self-entrepreneurs, a farrier, uh, an auto mechanic, and you know that one, Arfe, which does the art with coffee, professionals and they have a radio program Sunday so I don't think the burden for Western Mass is going to be as highly uh, negative as anticipated. Okay. If I could just interject with all due respect I, I have to disagree with my colleague uh, because again and you know I've studied these numbers and, and I'm part of the national Puerto Rican agenda and really working on this crisis, that net number will impact us because we have, and studies have proven, that when any migrant or immigrant community is, is, is fleeing, in all essence of the words, they go to where their diasporan communities are. And with, again, five of the top 25 communities in the U.S. with the Puerto Rican diaspora, whether you're looking at percentages or population, five of those communities are in Massachusetts on both lists. So this diaspora are coming, and we know through census and through studies that the current diasporan wave, just similar to the 50s and 60s, are undereducated, are individuals looking for any way to really help them and their crisis and families out. And that's why, uh, you know, with all due respect, the chamber might see those individuals with access and wealth and privilege or those opportunities. But what we're seeing is a huge influx of individuals without that. And they're coming and they're staying with their family members who might be on low income or Section 8 or in their apartments. And then they get evicted because their family members have come. So with, with, with all due respect, we've already seen this migra migratory trend. But to go back to the history. How long have you seen the, yeah. 
I've been in Western Mass for 10 years and I've seen it, close to 10 years working in homelessness and housing, but this is a larger issue around the history. This begins around the colonization of Puerto Rico from the beginning, Spanish-American war times. The fact that Puerto Rico does not have equal representation in the U.S. Congress, they don't have two U.S. Senators or U.S. Congressmen, it goes around the status, whether you're for uh, independence, statehood, whatever the case may be, the island of Puerto Rico really doesn't have those same accesses that we do. It cannot file for bankruptcy, uh, you, you know, those triple bond, municipal bonds. We as taxpayers own part of Puerto Rico's debt. We have an opportunity, and this was established and ingrained from when the U.S. used to appoint governors to Puerto Rico. It is a colonization and trend that has existed from the birth of this commonwealth, this quasi, is it a state, is it not? Um, that is really at the core of this. And they, yes, we've seen this, and it's, it's a pattern in history always repeats itself. Mm -hmm. So for me, the notion that these are not the same kind of people that came for the 50s and 60s, you're absolutely right. It's a new wave. It's a wave that is extremely more desperate and looking for help. And I can just show you, you know, again, and speak to myself and what I've witnessed on the homeless side and on the services side. In Lase de Familias, a family resource center where I worked for for two, three years before the state funding was pulled, helped almost close to 5,000 families in two years. A big portion of those families, over 3,500, were Latino Puerto Ricans, okay? Looking for food access, clothing access, educational assistance and family engagement. So it is a different diaspora and wave that are coming in, but they need the help. We'll go back to the history a little bit, the recent history. Why were these tax breaks taken away from businesses uh, recently in 2006? Is there a reason for that, why the U.S. government kind of stopped all of that funding and, and help for those, uh, for those corporations down there? Would you be able to talk a little well, bit about it, that? It was, it was an agreement. It was to entice um, foreign, in, well, foreign investment, meaning you know, the United States investing into the island and creating uh, you know, a, a fiscal uh, opportunity for, for all, creating a tax bracket um, through employment. You, know, you, have, you, have, uh, you have more folks that are employed. They're, they're taxpayers, and thus that supports your, your government. That supports um, all the programs that are in place. So, you know, shame on, on those that took uh, opportunity to say, I'm going to do this to benefit my organization, my company, and have zero regard for what, they, what was left behind. And if you look at, you know, um, for many years, uh, folks came from the island, seasonal migrant workers, they came, Made their made some earnings here. You know, uh, the wages went back home, supported a family, and once the the season was over, they would transition back home. That was that was a trend for a very very long time. Growing up, I worked on the tobacco fields, and I remember l most of the folks that worked there were from the island. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle was one of those individuals that would come down, seasonal worker, uh, earn a living, send his wages back home, and as soon as the season was over, transition back. But Right now, it's a totally different landscape because now you're looking at the money that is owed. This is not something that can be pushed under the carpet. Um, I think folks are waiting to see what is the government going to do, what's going to happen with Puerto Rico. You could see a, a greater exodus than there was back in the 50s. It all depends what's going to happen with legislation. Talk, so, talking about the 1950s, there was an aggressive program of economic restructuring that I'm just going to read off that it was called Operation Bootstrap that was launched in order to modernize the Puerto Rican corporations looking for low taxes and cheap labor. Naturally, the type of development program was always intended to benefit corporations more than the people of Puerto Rico, such as the ostracity of policies and the force on the island today are designed to protect the interests of investor class, not necessarily the people. So now these corporations are moving off the island and the people there who maybe worked for the corporations are no left longer no have jobs. jobs. They've, they've, the, the large corporations have earned their earnings, right? Their investors have, have, have earned their earnings as well. And when you look at big corporation, who is their responsibility to? To, to their investors. So that, at the end of the day, they're the ones who want to get paid. So this, you know, there's total disregard, as, uh, as Councillor Gomez was saying, you know, um, my cousin worked for one of the larger uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies in Puerto Rico, uh, was, a, uh, was a shift manager, and she was making $10 an hour. And this was not too long ago. And you look at th this, this, corp this pharmaceutical company, billion dollar corporation, her same position here on the mainland as a, as a shift supervisor, she probably would have been paid 
20, 30 dollars easy an hour, and she's been she had given 10 years of her life to this company. Katie, uh, if I could interject here, mm -hmm. your answer to the you know why did that happen? Section 936 being revealed. Well, it was timed, and uh, that was Clinton. I mean, he could have uh, he could have um, uh, extended it, but the the debt that Puerto Rico has was uh, as a result of this what they call a triple tax exempt. Uh, for it was established in 1917, and then in, in 19, since 1973, for four decades, the Puerto Rican government started uh, issuing debt with these bonds because it was the the holders of the bonds, the investors that are now old, uh, had it, didn't have to pay taxes on the interest that payments that they received. So Puerto Rican government continued refinancing those bonds, uh, getting new ones with higher interest rate interest rates, and that's where the debt went to 71 billion, with 68 percent of the uh, per, uh, of the gross do, the domestic product. High numbers. What do we do now? I mean, it's it's it's, it's a, responses are, are uh, they had a what they call the Kruger report that says you have the advise the Puerto Rican government some common sense. You have to uh, have structural uh, change to your government and fiscal change to your government. Then the hedge funds, the ones that were on these investors, uh, these uh, bonds and everything, says no. They're, they came up with a report saying that the debt is payable as long as you collect more taxes, stop spending so much money, stop spending so much money in, on your education and create some partnerships. That's the way, you know, the, one of the solutions. Bankruptcy, don't pay the debt. There's a, a a lawyer in Puerto Rico says that according to the U.S. Constitution, the debt is illegal. Uh, there's another solution called autonomy, give them a little bit more autonomy with the status quo, or a little bit more state privileges. And, and, you know, it's pretty much complicated because we're not allowed, when I say we, I'm still Puerto Rican here in the mainland, we're not allowed to file bankruptcy. The U.S. government right now, every year, for their debt, raises the debt ceiling, mm -hmm. kicks the debt down the road. Mm -hmm. we, we're gonna, can't, we can't do that. And we're going to talk more about that just after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been discussing Puerto Rico's debt crisis and associated problems from that crisis. We were just talking about, or we were beginning to talk about who's to blame for this economic crisis. There's no easy answer to that. <laughs> and you guys are all very passionate about this. <laughs> well, well uh, uh, you see the passion, because I'm not even waiting for you to ask. <laughs> so, so you think about this. In 2008, there was a mortgage crisis in the United States. Bruce Marx and other people uh, from NACA went to Congress to testify, this is a crisis, we're gonna, you know, this is gonna mess up. The people that were providing, the banks were providing the subprime loans did so knowingly that it was structured to fail. Then we have hedge funds, similar as to Puerto Rico, investing and betting that these mortgages were gonna fail. It happened. Mm. We've had this warning since 1917 when we became U.S. citizens mm -hmm. and having that triple tax package allowing the Puerto Rican government to issue debt and mm -hmm. just kick it down the road without the opportunities of bankruptcy or raising the debt ceiling or other things. And also, as Nelson's probably going to mention, other structures that just kept us confined and not being able to grow and expand. Yeah, and for me, I feel like very strongly in saying this publicly, part of it, the onus is on the United States and the government itself. The Jones Act prohibits Puerto Rico from importing uh, its own goods. They need to, any imports coming or supposed to going to the island of Puerto Rico goes to Jacksonville, Florida, unloads on whatever ship or, embar or embargo it's coming on, and then gets loaded on U.S. merchant marine ships and then to the island of Puerto Rico. A box of cereal there is probably double the price of what a box of cereal his here is. Gas is through the roof. Oil Prices. And you have a saying for that. Yes, uh, un caja de confleja uh, allá vale más que un caja de confleja acá. It just means that that, that box of cereal costs more uh, there than here. And that's sad for us. And we, the U.S., and, and it's, again, it's a political climate. No one wants to tackle the real issues of the day. Why is it that the island of Puerto Rico can't have those, those merchant jobs? Is because there's 50,000 jobs in Florida, and that's represented by a congressman, by two U.S. Mm -hmm. senators, and Puerto Rico doesn't have that same even playing field, which is a, a travesty. And and also, we need to get that narrative out there that 40, um, like I've stated before, 42% of the debt 
is owned by Puerto Ricans themselves. $30 billion, that means people have invested their lives, their hard-earned money from Puerto Rico. They own that debt. And we as a, 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 a country need to take ownership of that. And that's why I was very proud of local Massachusetts, uh, you know, our U.S. senators, our U.S. congressmen speaking, and we would advocate Richie Neal to say the same thing, that we want to allow Puerto Rico to restructure its debt because we own it, and here in West, Western Massachusetts, and I'll let Adam speak to that, we have a direct connection to that here in Massachusetts. Um, it, it's no secret that the Oppenheimer funds and also the um, Franklin funds, which the parent company is Mass Mutual, and um, realistically, Mass Mutual is instrumental in a lot of everyday uh, programs and things that are happening here in Springfield and in Holyoke. But we have a responsibility to ask um, the president or ask as, as, as constituents here as residents to understand what is it that we can do as a community to help that situation. There's some people that, or, or some elderly, that they go into retirement and some of, the, some of their investments, they don't even know, you, you probably don't even know that some of your investments, you probably own a debt of Puerto Rico's uh, of, uh, of hedge fund, you know, those are risky hedge funds which are called vulture funds that are, are, are strangling our economy and, and, and the island. Like, we have had so many different um, um, proposals on how to restructure this debt, but realistically, um, these hedge funds, these, these companies are not, tr are, are not willing to work with, with Congress or the country or even Puerto Rico. It's like, they, it, it, it's, it's all say all, they just want to be paid. And I just want to jump in, and let's be honest, the, the, the blame is to share also right. with the, you know, they, there has been very corrupt and, and, and very, you know, kind of malfeasance from uh, elected officials in Puerto Rico. Uh, that's and that's why even in 2015, the FBI did arrest 10 government officials for bribery. So it's not totally, and, and that's what we're trying to say, I don't want everyone to hear from me and Adam, it's us, it's us. But for us, and this is this goes back to why if Puerto Rico had a little bit more autonomy, we could have had what we have here similar in Massachusetts, a state auditor, someone to audit the funds, someone to ask those deep questions and have that autonomy. Um, and But to that notion, because everyone keeps saying, well, oh, who's, who's checking the politicians in Puerto Rico? The government has been, and the people. We all know, everyone knows, it's a common narrative from a lot of people. Oh, I can check out con eso politico, and I know I'm a politician. You know, you have to check, you have to verify. We have as a community and a culture in the island of Puerto Rico is under microscope now looking at past governors and past individuals who have handled the money and the funds and the hope is that they do audit and that they are able to expose some of those things and we I stand united with a lot of my community saying if anyone did steal from our people on our island then they should be prosecuted to the extent of the law um, and but it all stems back from the formation of the US government even appointing governors in Puerto Rico so we have to start addressing the like I said the colonization I keep saying it I'll say it till the day I die the colonization of Puerto Rico is where this truly stems from. I agree with, with Nelson. I mean, if you go back historically and look at, at Puerto Rico, it didn't get off to a good foot. You know, it, it, there was no autonomy. Um, big business was running. You look at uh, the, first, the first major um, exploitation of the island was the sugar industry, mm -hmm. right? And then the coffee industry. Now you read the paper and, and it says, you know, Puerto Rico has no natural resources. Well, of course, it's been stripped. Mm -hmm. It's been left with nothing, right? So um, the only the natural resources we do have, which is probably our culture, and, and there's other things that we can revive. Um, but when you look at that, about 90% of our imports is coming from the United States, and 50% roughly goes out back to the United States. Where where does Puerto Rico have its ability to become itself and to be able to become responsible? We started off on the wrong foot. Hundred, you know, hundred and something years later, we're still in the same boat. Actually, it's even gotten worse. Would you say tourism would be uh, the beaches would be the natural resource, so to speak? Well, now, people yeah, love course. their beautiful be beaches. Um, there. The the beaches, yeah. But you know, if you look at who owns who owns mm -hmm. the con uh, who owns the the hotels, mm -hmm. no. they're American companies. Mm -hmm. There's not unless it's a small hotel. Um, we don't own any of these. You know, the the tourism industry should belong. To Puerto Rico should belong to its people, but it doesn't. It belongs to a larger corporation who has no interest in, in, in the people or in its progress. If they did, if you say, yes, you know, we're all for Puerto Rico, then why are where we're at right now? One of the, sorry, David. No, no. One of the things is, you, know, you see that he says that who owns the property? Right away, when the U.S., uh, uh, Puerto Rico was ceded to the U.S., not so much long afterwards, 
all of the property, the best properties, all across the island were quickly taken by one or two individuals. I forgot their names. You, you, you look at the political structure here in the U.S. We are the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Independent Party, the Green Party, and maybe maybe one or two more. In Puerto Rico, it's PNP, PIP, and what's the other one? PDP. They, they are aligned in, in, in so far to define themselves in the relationship to the U.S. PNP, New Progressive Party, means a status quo. It, we're not a state, we're liberated. It's status quo, exactly what it is now. And then PPP, one of the other one, I forgot what the name it was, is pro-statehood. Well, all we want is define ourselves, let's just become a state. And then the other one, PIP, is the Independence Party. No, we don't want to remain status quo, we don't want a state, we want to be an independent uh, country. Those are our political parties based on the relationship with the U.S. And whenever there's an issue, a big problem, every 10, 15 years, the U.S. says, do a plebiscite and decide which one of those three that you want. Yes, great, we get to vote. Unfortunately, that vote is, has been seen as conspiratorial with the U.S. participating mm -hmm. in such a way so that the numbers always get even, Stephen, with statehood and status quo in the Independence Party gets 2 to 3 percent. I firmly believe if you create an opportunity in the Puerto Rican mind that an independence country is the solution, that they can see that the economy will work out because we have autonomy. Mm -hmm. That's one That's of the it. best options. But there you go. We're going to talk about statehood and, and what you guys all think about Puerto Rico possibly becoming a state or becoming an independent nation right after this break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about the economic crisis in Puerto Rico. We talked a little bit about the background of this crisis. Now this is a very heated topic. Maybe not everyone will agree on this, but that's okay. That's the point of the show. We like a nice debate. Uh, what do you guys think of the possibility of Puerto Rico becoming a United States state, the 51st state? I will throw myself out there and, and be on the chopping block first. I am 100% pro, pro Puerto Rico's independence. Um, and I think that amazing Puerto Ricans like Don Pedro Albizu Campos, Oscar Lopez Rivera, all of these individuals that we've highlighted and a lot of, and I could speak for myself as a millennial, the younger generation Boricua diaspora are feeling the need that Puerto Rico needs to be free and independent. And look no further than um, you know the current U.S. elections. Puerto Ricans on the island, although U.S. citizens and get to vote in both parties' primaries, their vote for president do not count, and there's no electoral votes given to Puerto Rico. For me, we need to break the chains of colonization, and Puerto Rico should be independent. But before we continue, we keep talking about how much influence economically and every other way, politically even, the U.S. has on Puerto Rico. So if all of a sudden Puerto Rico were to become its own country, wouldn't that country lose a lot of influence from the United States? And you can look no further than the Latin American countries of Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia. Those were all at one point, again, Spanish-American War, American colonies. And, you know, at one point, those colonies, again, had agreements with the U.S. to become independent, become their own. Look no further than the U.S. current relationship with Cuba. For years, it was standoff. We are not going to engage with this Caribbean nation. Um, Puerto Puerto Rico does play a vital role in its port and its location. It still has U.S. military bases. We're not saying that the relationship ends, but the respect of Puerto Rico as its own government and as a people, it needs to happen. So that's, I don't think that relationship will be diminished at all. Mia, yeah, I believe that it's going to take some time if that was the case. Um, I grew up in a house that was pro-statehood. Um, and now with uh, what's going on in our, uh, with our countrymen and our, you could say our nation in Puerto Rico, it, it, it's a tough conversation to have because you know you can see the benefits that um, becoming a state you know they can they could have ch um, filed for chapter 9 bankruptcy you know we could have restructured that that long time ago but realistically for us to um, kickstart our economy and to be able to trade with other countries mm -hmm. and, and and to bring some of those jobs back and and deal with other countries not only the United States it's beneficial for us to become independent but there are also some pros in becoming statehood but I think in the in the position we are now as a Commonwealth where we're honestly stuck at a hard place we can't go left we can't go right we could just stand here and hope that the diaspora of the United States and the ones that can vote for our presidents in our next elections would determine the um, a, a way for us to really find a resolve for Puerto Rico 
Well, regarding the independent statehood or status quo, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can tell you that, uh, I mean, I went to high school at Pedro Albizu Campos. I left Holyoke High so that I could have a diploma from Pedro Albizu Campos, and I learned the history of Puerto Rico in, in detail when I was 18, and I was ashamed of being uh, a, an American, mm -hmm. of what happened to Puerto Rico. So the reality is, though, I don't personally believe the U.S. would ever allow Puerto Rico to become a state. In any plebiscite, I think the, the U.S. government will get involved and simply not allow it. And the status quo, well, it benefits them to some degree. I mean, they have a strategic 16, 12 to 16 naval bases there forever. You know, one in, in Vieques occupied three quarters of an island, nine about five miles by 25, where the, the quarter of the island, the residents there, the 9,000 residents, equal to the 9,000 Puerto Ricans in Holio. In that, that ba naval base was stopped. It just doesn't make any sense that the statehood is going to happen. And the status quo does not benefit Puerto Rico. We just don't have the autonomy to be able to resolve the debt. The only solution is independence, mm -hmm. period. And then it's going to be hard, but we, have the, we would have the direct autonomy to make our own decisions. And all the trade and free trade agreements, the economy would benefit. There would need to be a transition period besides these restructuring of the current debt. They, that we have right now, there would need to be a, a transition period where the U.S. would still assist Puerto Rico. Now, it's not a, it's not a handout. When you consider uh, $40 billion going to Israel, uh, that is not even a territory of the United States. $40 billion going there for 10 years, $4 billion a year. Give that to Puerto Rico, see what can happen. I'm just saying. Thank you. Yeah. Well, growing up, you know, I was... Um, uh, <laughs> I, I was uh, on the side of being autonomous and being and being free. Um, uh, then I kind of transitioned over to okay, you know what? The Commonwealth status is working. Right now, because of our situation on, on the island, um, we do need a, a transitionary period. It can't happen overnight. The debt has to be addressed. Um, becoming a statehood or a state, uh, my pros and cons against that. The con primarily is loss of culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, my pro for it is somewhat of stability. Um, I think that Puerto Rico could definitely operate on its own. We haven't been given the chance. People don't really know us. They don't know our ability. They don't know our talent. Um, we can, as has as been shown, we have assimilated to the point of almost even losing our own identity. But we have something much more uh, deep than that, is that, that we can connect with people. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to connect with anyone. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't come because we're uh, United States citizens. It comes because of, of our heritage, of who we are. So, you know, I believe that we can be a force to reckon with if given the opportunity to, to be, you know, to, to, to um, direct, self, be self-directed instead mm -hmm. of being led by a leash. So. I'm still out there. I, I just, you know, I think that, that the future for Puerto Rico would be much brighter being independent, but right now, um, I don't know if it's a possibility to be a statehood for a short period of time just to be able to get rid of this debt and these problems, um, but I'm, I'm torn. Yeah, it's a difficult question, I know. We're going to take a break so that we have a lot of time to talk about how Puerto Ricans coming to western Massachusetts can get help and, and what you're seeing when it comes to you know, staying with families and living here now as this is all happening in Puerto Rico. So you're watching 22 News in Focus and we'll be right back. You're watching 22 News in Focus. We've been talking about the history of Puerto Rico and the economic crisis there. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about how, how all of this is impacting Western Massachusetts, namely Holyoke and Springfield, Chicopee, you know, the Pioneer Valley. Um, so first you guys have been working in your communities with Puerto Rican issues for a while now. Yes, yeah, so I just got on the city council in January and our first day 
we passed the Puerto Rican cultural area for the flats in South Holyoke, which is where a large portion of the diaspora live. We just uh, recently passed the Free Oscar Lopez uh, resolution, which is around a, a, an independent uh, Puerto Rican activist who's calling for the independence of Puerto Rico. And regardless of the statehood status, it has united our community. Um, and working with uh, organizations like the Rebirth of Nueva Esperanza, Enlace de Familias, working with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in Holyoke, we are trying to connect as a community. And I and my colleagues all in Holyoke, we've even started a Latinx uh, leadership agenda where the community is trying to get together to create its own agenda in Holyoke about how we can help on the state side um, in addressing these issues that are facing our communities, which are basic quality of life issues. Uh, the average annual income of South Holyoke is $11,500, and yet that is overwhelmingly close to 85% Puerto Rican Latino population. So there are amazing quality of life issues that we have to do here to help the Puerto Rican diaspora that's currently here and the ones that are potentially coming here. And how does that put a strain on the rest of the community, though, people who may not directly be impacted by Puerto Ricans coming here, maybe aren't Puerto Rican, w would that affect their tax money and everything else? So I, I think overall it's, it's, it's tied hand in hand, um, but uh, to that effect, this is a institutionalized system that has always had race and class issues. Mm -hmm. So that's always been where the, even the migrant and immigrant, uh, you know, Irish workers of Holyoke, when they first came to Holyoke, that's the neighborhoods that they live in. Uh, and that's, again, uh, you know, I hate to sound like the radical guy as always, but that's why I am. Uh, it is a, a systematic system of racism and classism and poverty. Um, and that's regardless if you're Puerto Rican or not. That is what has happened. Uh, but we have to address those huge quality of life issues, including incarceration. It, it affects most brown and, 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 and poor people in this country. And helping these individuals just get jobs, move up the socioeconomic ladder, uh, and encouraging them to become entrepreneurs. There's still a lot of work to be done. And it, I, I see it not as a one group is paying more or chipping in. It's a whole community issue. Mm -hmm. And I think the city of Holyoke has gotten that, um, which we're excited. And that's why we just uh, a couple weeks ago voted in Diosdado Lopez, our fourth Latino Puerto Rican city councilor on the council, the first time ever that there's been four Puerto Rican councilors on the council at one time, um, because we realize that we need to address this issue as a whole community. And I have great colleagues on the council and even the mayor. The mayor wrote a letter about the economic crisis in Puerto Rico. We passed the free Oscar resolution. We're working in tandem to say this is an entire city and now regional. We're working with Adam and Springfield and the region to say it's a regional issue. This past Monday, on uh, w the Springfield City Council unanimously uh, accepted a resolution to the Congress to find a result for the Puerto Rican uh, fiscal crisis. It was sponsored by myself and City Councilor from Ward 8, Orlando Ramos. And also, I sponsored another resolution to free Oscar Lopez because it's important that we create this awareness because this is a, a city or this is a region that since the 50s that has been Puerto Rican. Latino now, that there's different other ethnic backgrounds coming to our communities. It's not just, you know, we have a Dominican community, we have Mexicans, we have Guatemalans, and we have to show them that we've been here this long, that we need to stand in solidarity with our other Latinos, especially around this issue, because this issue is affecting, is affecting more than just our region, but now it's gonna start affecting where there's other places like we were talking about on our break, that um, like Orange and Greenfield, and, 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 and th this is gonna start pushing our people out, but putting more people in different places. So we're gonna grow as a, a, as a, as a diaspora in Western Massachusetts. And um, I commend my colleagues and I commend uh, um, Nelson that we also had a chance on April 23rd to be part of a bigger delegation with um, Congressman Luis Gutierrez, Congressman Luis Serrano, Nidia Velasquez out of New York, and um, a lot of other state officials and other council members that came down to Wall Street to talk about this on a national level, mm -hmm. to really talk about how, like um, Jose Ribeiro had stated, that that the, mig the, the migration is, is hitting Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, these battleground states where you know, I don't want to um, put it into a political aspect, but we can, um, we are part of the Latino vote and those places that are seeing this influx in, in, in population, these people, when they come here, that we're going to remember who who was there for the Puerto Rican community. And um, we're going to impact this year's election and you're going to see that with the Latino vote. And I want to jump back into the orange and, and greenfield conversation for people who may not understand why they're moving to those communities where it's not Holyoke and Springfield, not traditionally having these Puerto Rican communities. So could, David, first, could you talk about uh, why they're going into these other communities? It's uh, available housing. 
is the primary reason why we're seeing folks living in these rural uh, areas within the state, which also brings its, its, its own challenges. One of the challenges for folks transitioning to these areas is uh, the culture. It's a culture shock for them. Here, or locally, regionally, Hamden County, even Hampshire County, folks could go into a store and, and find uh, you know, local staple items. When you move out to rural parts of town, uh, you don't, you know, there's no, uh, our staple food is diminished, is gone. Plus you add into that the, um, the language barrier. So um, in Franklin County, for example, predominantly uh, white and, and, and speak uh, English. So that causes a, a strain for, for our folks if they transition out there. The great thing is, is that, okay, now we have a community, a Hispanic community mm -hmm. in, in the Franklin County area, but what good is it if there's not a support system for them out there? It, it, it defeats the purpose. And I'll say we're going to end with you now. What resources are available for people who may be coming from Puerto Rico and, and always have been, you know, not necessarily sure. in these past few months, but what resources are available for people here other than staying with family members who may already be well, here? Well, I can only answer from the perspective of the Latino Chamber of mm -hmm. Commerce uh, and, and how we've been able to help people recently coming here. But before I do that, I really want to highlight that we're ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this. We have for the city of Holyoke, uh, Nelson Roman, GLB, Gladys Lebron Martinez, Josie Valentin, Diosdado Lopez, and here in Springfield, Orlando Ramos, Adam Gomez, State Reps, Aaron Vega, Carlo Gonzalez, and Jose Tosado. I mean, this is, and then the countless number of candidates, Latino candidates that believe they can. This is spreading out through the whole community. Mm -hmm. We're inspired, we're ready. I mean, the people that I have seen at the chamber has been people who are looking to start businesses or expand their, their current businesses, mm -hmm. either professionals or, or, or laymen. This has been going on for a little while right now, not just the recent diaspora, but the chamber has been ready to help them out. I don't think, I don't, again, I repeat, I don't think the numbers are going to be affecting us here locally that much. I think they're going to be going primarily all to Florida, but we're ready if they do come here. We're going to make it happen. Yeah, and, and I do want to mention, too, that these people that are coming aren't necessarily people who were extremely low income in mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. They're mm -hmm. doctors, and you were mentioning this at the beginning, that they lost their jobs first. Mm -hmm. And right. so they're coming here looking mm -hmm. for opportunities. Mm -hmm. right. So these people are all being helped, right? Well, Not and, just and, and, and then many have come here without losing their jobs. It's just a transitioning thing. Like I said in the beginning, we go back and forth the whole time. If, if the economy is slow, you look at it, you have a lot of young people, like um, Nelson stated earlier, that are coming to, to the mainland, that they have, they went to school, so they have uh, loans they have to pay back. Mm -hmm. And if they can't find that kind of employment, they're going to come to the mainland and the closest place, like he said, Florida, which is uh, uh, mainly where um, they've seen the influx, the majority of the influx. These, these young people, um, just to give you, a, a, there was a children's hospital, the only children's hospital on the island, have 70 opens for nurses. There's not enough funding for, yeah. for to, to employ some of these folks. So some of these people, like my cousins, have came over here that used to be an ambu um, used to work on ambulances and come, is coming here, and he has all his certificates, and the things that we're not talking about is that when these professionals come here, they have to fall under the qualifications and probably go back to school and get those necessary steps to, to, to be able to work here in our state depending on what it is that the profession is. So there's a lot of um, um, contributing factors to why they're moving here and not necessarily that they're, they're, they're like he said that they're poor or that they can't find the main thing is that there's no jobs so they're gonna come here and figure out like the American dream like our parents came mm -hmm. and 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 that our American dream was to work on the fields now the the, the greater thing is that our, uh, our our community has grown to become doctors lawyers politicians and and, and, and senators so then when they come over here they uh, their American dream is is a lot more brighter than just the field. But if I could just uh, really quickly. Really quick. I just want to interject that the, the people coming here can go to Gandara and Lasa de Familias, mm -hmm. the, the, the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. Hit up your elected officials. There are opportunities, and our community is ready for you to come, but there's still work to do. And with those quotes of who's elected, to just give you a quick perspective, Holyoke, a city of 40,000, half are Latino, only four out of 15 counselors are Latino. We still have work to do, mm -hmm. so that we are ready, but there's still work that can be done, but you can go to any of those locations. Excellent conversation, and we'll have those resources sources for you on our website as well. You're watching 22 News in Focus. We'll be right back.
You've been watching 22 News in Focus. Today we discussed the economic crisis in Puerto Rico and how it's crippled communities there as well as impacted us here in western Massachusetts. We also have many resources available for you at home. So that's our program today. We want to thank our guests for joining us for this interesting conversation. Thanks to you at home for watching. And remember, if you missed any of it or you're looking for those resources, you can watch it all in full on our website, wwlp.com. From all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a wonderful Sunday.